Welcome to the 100 subscriber special. According to YouTube Analytics, if you're watching any of my videos, it's probably because you have some interest in Endless Ocean. If that's the case, you may be wondering why I haven't posted an Endless Ocean video in half a year. Well, I have too. So, let me introduce you to my little friend Endless Ocean Blue World. For my European and Australian pals, you may know it better as Endless Ocean 2 Adventures of the Deep. As if the game didn't have enough titles, in Japan it was called Forever Blue Call of the Ocean. On balance, I do like the Japanese name the most since the ocean is not, in fact, endless. Anyway, I want to start this video by saying that I don't want this to be a video comparing the two games since many people have only played the second without playing the first. I do plan on making a comparison video later, but for now, we'll be discussing Blue World on its own merits. The game starts us off in media res with a cutscene featuring both more cetaceans and more bloom than any other cutscene I've ever seen. Goodness me, it's gorgeous, by the way. I mean, look at that whale. Basically, the plot has been focused around this mysterious tone, the Song of Dragons, that has a tendency to send animals into a frenzy. And that tone has led you to this cavern. Once you go down into the cavern, the story goes back to the beginning and you have to create your character. This scene reminded me a lot of the equivalent scene in Animal Crossing Wild World. In that, a taxi driver asks you questions to determine your appearance before starting the game proper. Replace taxi with boat and you have Endless Ocean Blue World. On a similar note, I love the detail that your character portrait will be angry or sad if you attempt to overwrite or erase the save file. The man driving the boat is Jean-Éric Louvier, owner of L&L Diving Service. He used to run it with his son, but he passed away while researching the Song of Dragons, so we can assume that the other L is for Jean-Éric's granddaughter, Oceana Louvier. <coughs> Over the course of the game, you and Oceana convince Jean-Éric to allow you to pursue the Song of Dragons, and your growing team takes off around the world to dive in some fairly unique environments. I will say that the first and last maps feel a little too similar to me personally, but the last one has an abyssal region, so we'll give it a pass. The northern coast of Canada, however, does not get a pass since it's just Antarctica, but worse. You start the game in competition with the international treasure hunter Gaston Grey, or Gigi, if you're pressed for time. It doesn't take long to assimilate him into your team, like the Avatar. Your other new companion is Hayako, though she just asks you to watch a polar bear for a while, and you're like, well, I would have done that anyway. Once you've stared at the bear long enough, she's part of the team. In addition to the human members of the team, you recruit a surprising number of dolphins. When you dive with them, you can hold on and get around the map faster, which is convenient, but I still think dolphin training is basically the weakest part of the game. Once you have your full human team, you'll start getting quests from them, and I strongly recommend you do these as the game goes on. In my first playthrough, I did the entire story first, and it feels like quite a regression whenever you get a quest to take a picture of a fish in the first area after your globe-spanning adventure. Each member of the team will give you a different type of quest. jean Eric gives you quests to take photos, Oceana asks you to take people on tours, Gigi gives you salvage requests, and Hayako gives you quests relating to the dolphin partners. All of these will tie into larger side quests, which is part of why I recommend starting early, as they hold a surprising amount of extra content. This is why a common post in the subreddit is showing 100 plus hour save files. In addition to these side quests, there are a number revolving around finding legendary animals. While I think this is a strength of the game, it isn't without fault. The following is entirely a matter of opinion though, so take that as you will. There's a total of 26 legendary animals, which is honestly too many. While there are a few that are really cool, a rather significant chunk of the list is just what if this mundane animal was bigger and maybe had its palette swapped. This isn't always uninteresting since context can pick up the slack for a lackluster design. The Phantom, for example, is just a manta ray with unique markings, but it's implied to be the spirit of the former lord of the castle. On a less supernatural note, there are some, like the Gravedigger, which is just a larger giant isopod. However, learning that it's Oceana's favorite animal and hearing her talk about it still adds context. There are others, however, like Lady Dorothy, which is just a big red sturgeon. I think the list of legendary animals would have been stronger if they pruned the less interesting ones. As it is, working on a quest I assume will end with a legendary isn't as exciting because I know there's a distinct possibility that the animal will just be a slightly larger version of something I've already seen. With that, I'm going to wrap up this overview video because going any deeper into the mechanics would cause this video to be an hour long. Instead, I plan on doing a series of smaller videos covering individual aspects of the game because Endless Ocean 2 is big. For example, I barely even mentioned salvaging in this game and believe you me, I have opinions on that. Anyway, if you want to stay up to date with my thoughts on Endless Ocean as well as my descent into Endless Ocean-induced madness, subscribe here and check out my Twitter in the description. Until next time.